Welcome everyone, um, and thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. My name is Lungelo Maniati, and um, I'm, I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. Uh, that will be Michael Walton. Uh, Michael Walton is a biomedical uh, engineer, uh, and he has been working with SeaWorld, uh, uh, Rigel, for 26 years. He has an experience in clinical engineering and metrology. He graduated from Cardiff University with an MSc in clinical engineering and has been active uh, in the healthcare industry for many years. Michael is a UK representative member of IEC Technical Committee, that is TC62 stroke SC62 AWG. Um, common aspects of electrical equipment safety used in medical practice and a BSI member uh, of common aspects of electrical equipment used in medical. So without wasting any time, um, I'm gonna give the platform to Michael to share his experiences and uh, knowledge about test equipment. Michael, over to you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, you do need to disable uh, the screen sharing because I cannot share my screen. So I need share screen and write. There you go. Right, everybody see that? Perfect, yes. Michael. Right, okay. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, yes, I've been employed um, with Rigel for quite some time, since I was 16 year old, 26 year. Been lucky enough to be educated in that time whilst working uh, on an apprenticeship scheme and then developed. And uh, here I am as category manager and an expert in electrical safety. Um, we have many, many technical talks and educational talks on our website and on YouTube uh, that cover some of the main aspects of biomedical engineering, electrical safety, 60601, 62353, uh, other areas of um, electrosurgery, defibrillation, uh, infusion, patient simulation, vital signs. Uh, there's, a, we, there's a lot on there on that topic, very good. Um, and if you sign up for our website, you'll be uh, informed of our technical webinars uh, of that vein. Um, this is something slightly different. Um, this is a, a message more aligned to the dear roles and responsibilities and demystifying some key criteria of metrology, very top level. There's not an element of granularity. I'm trying to keep it interesting at least. Um, but if you do have any further questions, we'll, we'll leave those to the end. Right, so a little bit about Rigel. So who are Rigel? Rigel Medical, renowned globally, is a designer and manufacturer of portable appliance uh, testing for, in the biomedical testing industry. Uh, our products are a key component of keeping people, uh, people safe, patients safe, and visitors safe in a healthcare organization. We test medical devices. Um, part of that is electrical safety, part of that is performance testing. And I'll go a little bit into that uh, later on. Rigel are based in the Northeast of England. That's why I have an accent. Um, if anyone doesn't understand the accent, ask us to repeat something, uh, I'll be able to repeat it, no problem. Uh, other operating location is in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and we've got, you know, 40 years worth of experience. We've got service centers around the globe. We've got a service partner in uh, South Africa. Uh, and we've selling our products with vast experience in over 110 uh, countries. 
So what are we uh, talking about in this webinar? What is interesting? Where, where is the value for you chaps to sit through this for another half an hour, 40 minutes or so? Well, original uh, equipment manufacturers, that's the uh, manufacturers of, of um, medical devices, in their service manual, they will recommend test tools, which needs to be understood. Oh, clinical engineers, biomedical engineers, whichever phrase you want to use, all metrologists by definition. So what does that mean? It means that biomedical engineers measure stuff because medical devices measure stuff. So with metrology, you need to understand specification because specification will give you the tools to find the correct test instrument that is a requirement for traceability and all of these best practices for metrology. Uh, and an example for that might be, you know, uh, I'm measuring the temperature in a room, just go on a little bit of a tangent away from test instrumentation. What are I think the temperature is? Well, I'm thinking it's a, the air con zone. It's about 21 degrees in this room, but I don't know that for a fact. So I'd need to buy a thermometer, but how do I know that the thermometer is accurate? So the, the thermometer might be specified plus or minus one degree Celsius, but how do I, how can I trust that? So ha having an understanding of specification is going back to where the traceability is, where the accuracy is and the proof of the accuracy to unravel the uncertainty of whatever you're measuring. And this is key within medical devices. This is what clinical decisions are made uh, doing that. So really what we're trying to do is prove, um, get the message across that there's an underlying or equivalent message with test equipment in medical devices. But ultimately it's a freedom of choice um, uh, every requirement, and it doesn't matter what you buy, you do your research. Now, I've recently moved over from Android to um, to iOS, first ever iPhone. I done my research. I looked on YouTube. I read reviews, and you know, so on. It's, you're making a capital investment. So um, really what you want to be doing is making the right chance, chance, choice for yourself. Now that's a commodity, test equipment is special, uh, test equipment is a speciality, uh, specific to a particular requirement. So having that extended knowledge really upskills uh, you as an individual in biomedical engineering, but also in the overall holistics of uh, biomedical and clinical engineering per se. And I think it's a fun part of the job, uh, being able to evaluate these things, having a, a device on demo, um, realizing what the UI is, because really what you, much of test equipment features are the same. So really it's about having that relationship with the product and the after sales and the overall value proposition of what you're, what you're investing in to get the uh, maximum output out of. So that's, that's something that this presentation is about because the key objective really is maintenance because we want to inhibit medical devices uh, from failing and from having inaccuracies. And effectively, this is part of risk management. Risk management, I'll go into later on, some ISO standards and whatnot. Um, preventative maintenance schedules are a useful tool to use when, um, when maintenance is on the agenda. Asset management software and um, having your schedule for work um, the preventative maintenance side is key because that's the periodic test that is used in life cycle management of uh, medical devices that we're all used to. Uh, but it's understanding the risk of such tools and it's also understanding 
the test steps and what the intervals mean. Some might be three months, some might be six months, some might be 18 months. And understand really what the recommendation means. And I've got some real world examples of that. So a, a service my, manual might refer to a, a specific device uh, that might even be irrelevant. And you, this is the guidance from the original equipment manufacturer. Michael, how can it be irrelevant? Well, I'll show some examples of why it is irrelevant. Um, and then you know, you've got other areas of uh, preventive maintenance procedures that you can take amongst, amongst yourselves as a department to make decisions, clinical decisions uh, on risk, um, as long as we understand that uh, there's no proof, uh, there's no, you're not adding extra risk. Um, you've got a risk file that proves that this is a good uh, alternative. So an alternative to a preventative maintenance schedule is documented evidence. Um, this could, an example of this could be, and this is really relevant in university hospitals that perhaps might have a little bit more expertise and a little bit more resource to look at these things, but however, nevertheless, uh, a university hospital might have four or five different manufacturers of patient monitoring and uh, the clinical decision and the decision with alternative maintenance is to standardize on one procedure rather than multiple procedures where you, you consolidate all of the test procedures into one and it makes it much more easier and I'll go into that uh, slightly later on in, a, in the next slide. But what needs to be understood, understood is, as long as there's no adverse effects to patient care, um, then a department is free to explore their own methods and frequencies of, test, of testing outside of what a service manual will suggest. Um, this is a proactive activity. And of course, this depends on local legalization uh, and litigation, but is the, is the norm in many, many countries. So to develop this alternative maintenance uh, or, or alternative equipment maintenance, certain things need to be understood. Um, you've, you've looked at what the problem is. The problem is testing medical devices. Uh, across different ranges of vendor and manufacturing and consolidate the solution really, sorry, is to consolidate that and have one test procedure to cover uh, all of the different test devices. Now, there's, a, there's an element of risk to that. And is there a clinical need with tangents and other specifics around uh, a feature of a uh, device. This, is, this needs to be assessed. All this needs to be risk assessed and put in a risk file, but it's just understanding these things that upfront, there could be a, an additional cost and resource. Um, but if you thoroughly plan out the management system, then alternative equipment maintenance can be uh, enrolled into a department, and this is better use of staff time. There's a re reliability of the data. Essentially, risk mitigation, because we are risk mitigators. Uh, a biomedical uh, job role is to mitigate risk within healthcare. That's its number one aim by keeping patients safe. Um, and of course, there's uh, quality assurance on top of that. So I'm gonna go over some real world examples of some service manuals that I've pulled off uh, the internet that you know, we've got experience in. And I just wanna pull out some, some information here. So this is for DFib. So if I, I've bought the DFib, uh, the, sorry, the procurement department and the team of all, We've invested in a set of defibs with a uh, particular 
uh, original uh, equipment manufacturer. And now we're at the part of onboarding it as a life cycle management. So we need to decide what testing we're going to do and how we're going to do the testing. So typically, you would get some advice from the manufacturer themselves, but they also provide service manuals. Now, within this service manual and within the majority of service manuals, they will always highlight the test equipment that they uh, advise can be substituted, as long as you understand the specification. So it's the responsibility of the biomedical personnel to maintain this device and uh, to make sure that the test equipment has that equivalent standard. And by equivalent, what we mean is uh, the defibrillator manufacturer will suggest a manufacturer or a part number of an electrical safety analyzer, a defibrillator analyzer, uh, you know, a patient simulator. But often you will find very with, um, with older products, these are no longer in existence. These are obsolete instruments. Well, how can I make a decision? Okay, I might do some due diligence and Google and search, and I might have the experience, but what does that actually mean? Well, that's hard to define. So you need to go a little deeper and that little deeper is to understand the specification of what is being measured, how it's being measured, and what is the accuracy. And by understanding the specification within the description of the equipment that's uh, the manufacturer is asking for, in this case, a defibrillator analyzer um, with non-invasive pacemaker measurements, well, I've got the freedom of choice as long as my device fits these specifications, then uh, I can call up the rep and I can start to get demos in. And what will happen in reality is that a lot of people will just take the first look at the recommended device and say, that is the device for me, you know? Well, you can make that choice, but it might not be the best device for the marketplace. Uh, so, and for the department. So it's just having that um, understanding about specification and having the freedom of choice. Um, and we'll go into a, a little bit of that later on. So here's a, uh, another recommendation, and this is a recommendation for Rigel device. Rigel Medical are in many, many service manuals because we're a reputable company and we have good re working relationships with R&D teams all across the world. Um, but we don't want the monopoly with, uh, with OEMs. It, it's all about freedom of choice. And we advise similar equipment. But essentially, what we're, what we're trying to highlight here is that what is the best tool to do the job, really? And there's a number of areas outside of the criteria of specification. Um, but it's, it's just understanding what the device is being suggested in the service manual and how we best have the best practice to understand those requirements. So here's another one for patient monitoring. Uh, and this is really unusual. And it's unusual because this patient monitoring manufacturer is asking the department to have equipment for high pod testing. Well, high pod testing, which is high voltage testing from anywhere from a thousand volts to 4,000 volts is not a test schedule for preventative maintenance and life cycle in service testing. High pod testing is for 60601 design and development stage or end of line testing. You use high pot testing and high potential uh, voltages to find failure of a device, never used in repair, never used in um, uh, maintenance phase, only in manufacturing and in R&D to make sure that, you know, it's these levels in worst case scenario don't fail. 
So why is the service manual asking for high pot? Possibly an element that the R&D guy that put the service manual together isn't experienced. Not, there's a reality of that. You'd like to think that every OEM out there has superior knowledge of testing. No, there's some interns and there's some very junior guys doing this stuff. Um, so this is a biomedical engineer being able to see beyond this and think, well, my department does not need to buy uh, an associated research high pod tester when I can do an electrical safety test with you know, uh, electrical safety analyzer, either test to 6 or 6 or 1 or 62353. So that's, that's where the experience in being a biomed is key because you can read through some of these requirements and you can make an informed decision. What is the best equipment for your department? So these are the elements. And uh, I think this is a really good example, uh, but you'll also see highlighted in, in yellow that, and then we've grayed out the, you know, the uh, suggested because, you know, the competitors and whatnot, but, our equivalent is always used in service manuals. So they might suggest Rigel, our equivalent. They might suggest uh, an older device like a Metron or a Dynatech Nevada or a uh, Biotech, but they'll always suggest our equivalent. So they I mean that, that it is, a, is a key point. And, and really that's what this presentation is about. And then we've got another example, which I think is really, really good because electrical surgical generators um, will ask for components of a measuring system. There's no um, electrical surgical analyzer in this list. These are other methods to measure current of an electrical surgical unit and uh, different components that make up a system for measurement. So you'd want a digital multimeter, a true RMS voltmeter, and oscilloscope. Well, you don't need all this stuff because all of this stuff really is an electrical surgical analyzer like a Rigel and Unifem. So it's just having that extra knowledge um, uh, that you cannot, you kind of take for granted what is in a service manual as the gospel truth. Uh, you need to think beyond that when evaluating uh, test equipment for your department. So I hope hopefully that's a clear message on how we tackle you know, procurement and understanding requirements for testing. I, I personally speak, I mean, whether I'm a nerd or not, I don't know, but I, I, the specification and unraveling the mystery, it, it's a fun bit of the job, you know, it really is. Uh, and you, you, you're upskilling your knowledge in, a, in a, an area which is uh, you know, good for the CV, but good for your career uh, and so on. Anyway, there's another element of, um, of a clinical engineer's role, which is vital to understand and will add value. Um, and it's a dull subject. You know, it's a very dry subject, but it, it's here for extra reading where quality management systems and having a, a knowledge of asset systems and uh, asset management systems uh, too is, is key where there's policies, procedures, and uh, processes. Now, the overall purpose is to make patient, uh, patient care better in a healthcare organization. That's, that's why we have these real robust best practices like quality management systems and something like ISO 9001 is implemented across you know millions of companies across the world in healthcare ISO 1345 is the choice for quality management uh, but it, it is for the OEMs and manufacturers and service companies it's it's a lot but ISO 9001 is still a solid framework for any organization to adopt when um, managing any department. And then there's risk management. 
So risk management, ISO 14971, uh, gives an understanding of all different layers of risk. Um, the interesting one for me was always residual risk. Residual risk is something that you, you, you try and mitigate the risk, but some uh, risk has to be accepted in an organization. And, but again, it's understanding what that, uh, that residual risk might be. I mean, a prime example would be, you know, a scalpel has a residual risk. It's a sharp surgical tool that will cut people open. There's no getting away from what it, its intention uh, or its clinical application is, uh, but there's a risk to handle it. So like, that's a, you know, an example of residual risk. Now, where risk management is, is really key is everything is about risk reduction. So in the, the medical device uh, design and manufacture, but also in the risk management of life cycle management of, de, of um, devices. So in a, a healthcare technology management department or clinical management, department. Um, we're looking at policies and procedures to be developed, measure, maintain, and reduce the risk for every uh, medical device. That's part of life cycle management. That's part of risk management. And all these things in quality management are interlinked with quality management systems. So um, really, it's about having that plan, do, check, act uh, thought process identify, analyze, evaluate, treat, monitor, review. It's a cycle and it's a continual cycle to reduce risk in healthcare. And then of course, you, we've got performance and safety as part as a key criteria of that. Um, so I, international standards like 60601 and dash one, and 60601-2, dash two, um, you know, one, 60601 is to evaluate electrical safety and mechanical safety of a device, all medical devices. And if I want to, if you as a manufacturer, I, I was Michael Walton, you know, medical devices, I would need to adhere to the best practices and requirements of that standard to put a medical device on the marketplace. So I need to conform to that uh, particular particular uh, standard for, for safety, for basic safety. 60601-2 is more performance related. So for example, a, a snippet out of defibrillator, uh, the defibrillator standard 60601-2-4, um, the, the manufacturer must have a defibrillator that will deliver energy across all impedances, plus or minus three joules, or um, plus or minus 15%. Well, what does that mean? That means if I'm delivering 100 joules um, from my device across different impedances, I'm either plus or minus 15% or um, plus or minus three joules. So 103 or 97 joules. The reason why this is, is because we want defibrillators that will stop the patient's heart if they're having a cardiac arrest across different impedances. Impedances being the thoracic cavity or chest of the patient. Why? Because if you don't have the right delivered energy as per the setting of the device, it is a useless device and it's not fit for purpose. So th th these are real key criteria for people's lives. And that's why test instrumentation, and that's why understanding specification is, uh, is key. So, you know, applying all, this, all these steps uh, uh, for the device uh, must be really understood in what the test and measurement is, is seeing when we are verifying these requirements. Now, medical device, um, manufacturers and maintainers, as suggested in service manuals, will provide recommendations, as I've 
discussed. What isn't specified in test equipment is standards. Standards will not give you, uh, they will not say use an electrical safety analyzer, they will not say use a defib analyzer. They might not even give advice on how you measure anything. They might just have a, um, a, a suggestion of measurement. So IE standards are never used to define um, test instrumentation because it's specialist. I mean, that's the, the key criteria. These are individual components that are put together, uh, dedicated devices uh, to make sure that we can safely test uh, original equipment manufacturers um, and test the, the parameters or, or safe to use. And this is applicable when testing all medical devices in every biomedical test department. Any test uh, tools uh, can be satisfactory, but ultimately it's the freedom of choice as long as you uh, understand the risks of use. So what we, what is, what is important with testing and maintenance? Well, the, the key criteria really is because there's multiple factors that can affect the safety and accuracy of a device in healthcare. Because remember, medical devices, the majority of medical devices will measure things or output energy, um, which will have its own control loop inside that is also measuring. So every uh, device that measures can drift. Has, these are used in stressful environments. There's wear and tear. Um, I don't really need to preach the areas of uh, why we test medical devices per se. It's like service in a car. There's, there's mechanical and measurements being made within the, the car. So we need any auto uh, vehicle needs a service um, to keep people safe who's driving the car. Very similar thing with that analogy. It can be uh, ported over to medical devices. And in addition, um, you know, there's this calibration drift and whatnot. Because op amps have DC offsets, no component is uh, free of failure. We're not living in a utopian ideal world. So we need to make sure that uh, when test equipment, when medical devices are being tested with test equipment, we have the calibration and we have the results and we make where everything is within specification. I mean, unfortunately, I was in a position a few years ago now, father took a heart attack, you know, he's in the ICU. I'm looking at the, uh, the mind ray monitor and I'm looking at all the vital signs. And I'm thinking, mm, the medical, you know, a, a simulators check the accuracy of this. And these doctors and nurses are making clinical decisions from the measurements being taken. And when it hits you home like that, it really does give you that uh, tangible aspect to why a clinical engineer's job is so valid and so important within, within healthcare. And of course, these regular checks a part of the um, preventative maintenance as per the, the last few slides and recommended by the, the, the original equipment manufacturer. Um, but the key part of the message is protecting the patient. So testing and performance, schedule maintenance, performance verification, and safety testing. So performance, Verification, an example is infusion device, syringe driver, checking that 100 milliliters uh, per hour is 100 liters per hour plus or minus the specification. That is performance specification. Safety testing is that the patient, the user, a visitor within a healthcare organization does not receive an electrical shock if the of medical devices in a fall condition. So two different criteria for safety, but two um, 
instruments or tools that are used to make sure uh, basic safety is met. It's very important. So when we're choosing the right biomedical test solution, um, all of this really becomes evident. Safety testing, performance verification, is streamlined with the, the right tools. And then how do we develop these alternative maintenance schedules? Well, as preventative maintenance, which is, we've spoke about a lot, and then we've got the life cycle. Now the life cycle goes all the way from design to decommissioning in various stages of its life. And it's the real um, simplest form of maintenance that can be executed purely based on the manufacturer's recommendation and then plot it into asset management software or however, whatever asset management tool the biomedical manager is using to schedule the jobs for the biomedical engineer. Um, but the, the key point really is that it, you can develop alternatives. And the alternative is this schedule-based maintenance. Uh, it can be expensive and resourceful to, to uh, implement, um, but there are ways and means of streamlining the PM schedule, as discussed earlier on, with gaining efficiencies by consolidating testing, by reviewing the results and the risk of the device. The, the disadvantages are that you know that you, you need that expertise, there's ownership and responsibility with detailed documentation and risk files. And of course, you need to thoroughly plan this stuff and execute it, uh, which all takes time. But you know, the, the longer this is a longer term plan. And when you develop it, really, it's to coincide with your asset management software uh, and to really have a lower risk of medical device failure within within your uh, healthcare organization where the corresponding risk level should always be reviewed, particularly critical devices. Going back to risk management, well, X-ray defibrillation might be outsourced. You might have a, your engineering team within the department, but you feel if a certain manufacturer is too risky, so we're just gonna outsource that. The OEM comes in and their service team and looks after that. That is a alternative way to mitigate risk and is a valuable way of doing that and transferring the risk to a third party, uh, which is another area of risk management. Um, anyway, so there's ways and means of implementing this type of methodology within a framework within healthcare. And I, I is, is a, the reason why I've gone into this and the reason why I'm speaking about it a lot is, is it really it's just having that extra understanding of requirements. Um, and then when we look at the asset management, so asset management software or CMMS as it's usually known, tracks medical device history which of course is another tool to identify and mitigate risk. Um, but the test results um, help optimize the maintenance. So you might find actually that I've tested this device every year and you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident I can move the interval from six months to 12 months. Well, that's viable too. But it, as long as you understand the risk and what has been repeatable and what's acceptable around the accuracy and the risk of the instrument. And then test and measurement and metrology. Well, he's a top level overview of measurement. In that measurement is an unknown quantity of a device under test. And when you go back to national uh, metrology institutions or the National Physical Laboratory or whatever the name is within your country. Um, it's just to understand that every layer of accuracy goes back 
a notch up. Now, this example is a perfect example of the factor of 10 in reality. Mm, test accuracy ratios are more four to one, even one to one can be considered um, if the risk is understood. So what does this mean? Four to one means that if I have a medical device that's 10% accurate at measure, measure an ECG, then my patient simulator uh, is 2% accurate. So that's a ratio from four to one of accuracy, and that fits under the pyramid of traceability um, for measurement. Uh, another example, actually, I'll, I'll go into that. Rather than using defibrillation, I'll use something a little bit similar. Um, an NIBP monitor might be 10, might be 10 percent, might be five percent. Let's just use 10 percent to simplify things. Then the pressure meter might be five percent, which is a ratio of two to one. But really, if you look at three to one, which is generally accepted, um, then you would be looking at point. Uh, sorry, you'd be looking at three percent accurate. But then you need a calibrator to calibrate that. Well, the, the department, biomedical department, might not, but they might have a test standard which might be one percent accurate. And then that 1% test accurate goes back to calibration laboratory, which might be 0.1% uh, accurate. And then that will go to a dead weight tester back at the National Physical Laboratory or Metrology Institution and so on. That's the cycle. That is the pyramid of accuracy. So good to understand. Specsmanship. Now, what is specsmanship? Um, specsmanship is when manufacturers in specifications of measurement is over-specified. You know, tenders, you know, bidding processes um, general, generally have irrelevant um, specifications. And every, um, every manufacturer of test equipment is guilty of this. Rigel are guilty of this and all the competitors. Because Rigel, Earth continuity or Earth bond can measure up to 20 ohms. So why do I want to measure up to 20 ohms? And many devices measure beyond, uh, beyond 20. It has no application. It has nothing to do with safety. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, this is specsmanship. And it's just understanding where the critical areas are for pass-fail. Well, pass-fail threshold is anywhere from 0.1 to 0.5 of an ohm. I mean, that's so the range of measurement over 20 ohms is it's a bit of a useless measurement, but it's specsmanship and there's competitor advantage, um, which is irrelevant really, uh, just to, to gain, you know, one superiority over another. But it's the really, it's understanding why this is done. Uh, and not having any relevance that just because something can, uh, has a wider um, a wider range of measurement doesn't mean necessarily mean it's better. And another example, going back to pressure, is I've seen 20 bar drug meters, sorry, I've used the manufacturer, 20 bar pressure meters that's used on an application for 200 millibar. Well, that is just beyond belief. But that, these are just understanding what specification actually means. And of course, that's where the test accuracy ratio comes in and accepting the factor of um, and what considerations are looked at with feature set and specification when purchasing a, a test tool. So it's important and don't be too absorbed by confair and like for like. Really, it's about freedom of choice and the biomed's choice. So I'll wrap this up. So we can use alternative uh, methods for testing. We've got alternative tools. And the recommendation is to look at the service manual and decide on your PM and how you're going to implement that. Any device with the same technological characteristics can be implemented. They're all the same, much of a muchness as far as 
specifications on it is it's really what's right for you. And then this right approach would be, is it portable? What is the user interface? How does this fit into my ecosystem within the, the department? And it's just having that evidence and having the idea of data when uh, evaluating the, the test equipment um, to make that choice. Now, when it comes to the choice, for me, I mean, if I speak about RIGL, medical, with the products, but also it's the after sales and it is having uh, the technical support and the calibration of, of test tools. That goes without sin. Um, it's not just about devices. So like, the demand of medical equipment, it just needs to be widely understood and having overall knowledge of accuracy, precision is a nice to have, but background reading, there's no harm in doing that, hopefully. Some of this presentation will lead to more background reading. Um, needless to say, understanding ranges, limits, and functions, it really is a, a whatever's appropriate to that application. So when you're making purchasing decisions, whether it be uh, tenders or whether it be uh, a, a suggestion from a, a service manual, just take into consideration that it doesn't necessarily have to collate or correlate to uh, the, the specification of the medical device. It's just having that extra added knowledge of how to understand specification to keep people safe in, in hospitals. And then if you were to, uh, and I've seen this in, implemented in many departments where there'll be a, an assessment for the right, for the, the right tools where you have a, a cheat sheet or a recommendation to, you know, uh, to, to find these things. And that, this is good practice. And effectively, all departments have a budget, um, which uh, needs, there's always a capital expenditure. Um, but what is right for the department? Is it simple to use? Is it easy to use? Is it portable? And what is the level of after sales support? And that the handhold and after, the, um, you buy the, the instrument, really, really uh, important. Um, anyway, that is the end of the presentation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to do a talk and this is uh, question time. So if anybody has any questions, um, please let us know and we can go into have a little bit of a Q&A. Thank you, Michael. Um, certainly um, have uh, learned a lot on my side personally, and also been reminded quite a few things with regards to test equipment and the choices also that one needs to make. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences and knowledge uh, throughout your 26 years of uh, experience. Um, Michael uh, has allowed us uh, to actually post this presentation on our web platforms. So if you have missed something, I know that with our current load shedding, uh, we might have issues with regards to continuous connectivity. But Michael has, uh, has, has been so kind to us to actually give us a copy of a presentation and also to give us a right to uh, post this uh, presentation on our web platforms. So keep an eye for this. Um, uh, you will be able to see it later on. Um, I'm looking at the chat box. Uh, I don't see any question. Um, I'm hoping that the message was clear. Or alternatively, we, if we have questions, as I said earlier, earlier on, we can uh, post those questions also maybe through our admin office and we can convey them to, to Michael to assist us with clarities. So, yeah, if uh, I see, yeah, as I said, I don't see any questions. I just would like to thank everyone for making time and allowing uh, us to share these experiences and uh, encourage everyone also to uh, keep an eye on our web platforms um, for our next webinars. Um, you, know, you will be notified accordingly. Uh, Michael, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, we hope to see you next time. It has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And hopefully 
in the very near future, we can do some one-to-ones in person uh, in South Africa. It would be my pleasure to do that. Uh, so maybe we can work on something like that in the near future. 100%, 100%. We will be in communication with your local office, uh, SCM, who is our one of our gold member. And uh, certainly we will arrange something. But thanks again for your time. No, no problem. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. This is the end of our session. Thanks Thank for attending. Bye. Bye.